and introduce Brenda. So Brenda Punsky is the Advocacy Director and Senior Level Psychotherapist at Terra Firma, a unique mental health medical legal partnership that's embedded within Montefiore Hospital's Bronx Health Collective. Uh, they provide trauma-informed services specifically tailored to unaccompanied immigrant youth and asylum-seeking families. Brenda herself provides trauma-informed individual, family, and group psychotherapy services and specializes in traumatic stress, complex trauma attachment, family systems therapy, and acculturation. Her expertise includes conducting psychological evaluations and writing affidavits in support of patients' asylum and other immigration cases, and training medical, legal, and mental health professionals both on how to interview for and write those evaluations and on best practices when working with unaccompanied immigrant youth and asylum-seeking families. Brenda's scholarship, scholarly publications include mental health as the cornerstone of effective medical legal partnerships for asylum seekers, as well as working with parents and children separated at the border, examining the impact of the zero tolerance policy and beyond. Brenda has collaborated with the ACLU's litigation by conducting and drafting psychological evaluations of asylum seekers stranded at the border under the migrant protection protocols in Matamoros, Mexico. In addition to her MSW degree from the Silver School of Social Work at NYU, Brenda holds law degrees from both the NYU School of Law and Universidad Ibo Iberoamericana uh, in Mexico and worked as a human rights attorney for several years be before becoming a social worker. Brenda was honored with NYU's Global Social Work Award for her outstanding international social justice work and studies. She is also a conflict mediator certified by the New York Peace Institute. So with that, I warmly welcome Brenda Punsky. Thank you very much, Ansley. I'm very, um, Ansley and Kathleen, I'm very honored to be here. So thank you very much for the invitation. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. There we go. Okay, so good morning, everybody. I am glad to see there's so much interest in this topic. Today, we're gonna talk about trauma-informed care for asylum-seeking families and unaccompanied immigrant children. Now, before I get started, I want to get to know you, um, the audience. I wanna see who is here. So I'm gonna start with asking some questions and some, the, um, so first of all, have you worked with this population before? Please um, respond to this poll that you see here. I'll give it a couple of seconds. I think there's still some coming in. I see 16. 16 answers, 17. Okay, so the majority has, but there's a good percentage that have not. So, okay, so this is good because uh, some of the information is gonna be maybe redundant to those of you who are experts in this topic, but uh, I want to acknowledge that there are people who are new to this area and so, we're gonna learn together. Okay, thank you. Now, the second question is, the second question, what is your field of practice or in what capacity or capacities have you had contact with this population? You can select one or more. Okay, so I see some, a little bit of everything, but this is this is interesting. The most has other. I wonder if the people who selected other could 
briefly unmute yourselves and just share what role you have or in what capacity you, you work with this population. Either unmute or you can put it in the chat. I see your resources in the chat. So he's working in resources. Okay. And it can, I see resources and community health I see both resources and community health worker. Yes. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so, and I also see, I also see some uh, mental health admin, like basically a little bit of, of everything. Uh, after other, I think it's case management and mental health slash social work, um, then followed by community organizer and admin staff. Okay, perfect. Next question. For how long have you been working with this population? Okay, so the majority, and I think it's just like the difference was one person, but um, the majority has been working for one year or less, or they're not super experienced in this field or in working with the population, but you have some experience. Um, the ones that do, but I, I do remember that some people said that you don't have contact or work with this population, okay. Okay, and lastly, and this is not a poll question, but rather either you can unmute yourself or, or write it in the chat. What would you like to learn today? for this population. Great. What ways I can be of better assistance and resource? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I got one that says, how can the philanthropic community best support short-term and long-term needs of the population? A very good question. What support is in place for them? Um, I also see practices to reduce risk of re-traumatization. Yes. Okay. Um, learn more about challenges this population face and how to link here to care. Okay. What type of social health issues the migrants were facing in their home countries? Okay, so a little bit of everything too. Um, so we're going, to, I'm gonna cover uh, probably many of this. Um, 
Okay. Um, I I encourage you to, if you have questions, you can ask them in the moment. If, if it's something that I'm going to talk about later on, I'm going to um, say so, and then we're going to, we're going to pin the question and go to it later. But if questions arise uh, as I'm moving forward, please let me know. Okay, so our goals for today are, and some are related to what everybody was saying, are to define and be able to identify unaccompanied immigrant children and asylum seeking families, to increase awareness of pre, during, and post migration experiences, to learn about trauma and its impact on unaccompanied immigrant children, UICs is unaccompanied immigrant children, and asylum seeking families. And finally, to understand some of the trauma informed best practices when working with this population. And in order to cover that, first I'm going to talk about the definition and, and how to identify unaccompanied children and families. And I'm going to talk about the experiences before, during, and after migration. Then we're going to take a break. Um, then we're going to come back. We're going to talk about trauma, what it does, what it is, and what it does, um, and how it looks in what it looks like in this population. Then we're going to take another short break. And then we're gonna talk about guidelines to provide trauma-informed care. Okay, so first of all, who are we talking about when we say unaccompanied immigrant children? Who are they? They are children, so, so under 18 years old, who are crossing the border without a lawful immigration, without lawful immigration status and without a parent or legal guardian who's able to take care of them at the moment of their crossing. And it's important to, to highlight the fact that it's, it has to be a legal guardian or a biological parent because even if they come and they migrate with, let's say, an aunt who's been taking care of them since the, since the day they were born, if they are not their biological parent or their legal guardian, they're going to be considered uh, unaccompanied. They're going to cross the border and they're going to be separated um, and the, the, the child is going to be considered a, an unaccompanied minor and then the adult may be considered just uh, um, a single adult. Um, and then adults with children or family units are those parents or legal guardians who cross the border with a um, child who is under 18 years old. Now, uh, it is very important that we learn to identify them because this, the, the population has very specific needs and we don't want to miss them. We can find them in both healthcare and non-healthcare settings. And these are some important questions that you can ask when working with someone uh, like in a clinical capacity or in a legal capacity or in, in any way that you're able to provide uh, support and care for this person, case management uh, anyway. Um, where, uh, where were you born? How old were you when you came to the United States? You know that if they're under 18 years old, they can be unaccompanied children. If they're older, they may not. Uh, were you apprehended by immigration patrol when you crossed? If they're not apprehended, they're not going to be considered unaccompanied minors unless like a whole legal process happens afterwards. Um, but that's usually not the case. And lastly, who were you with? A parent or a legal guardian or someone else when you cross the border? If they cross with no parent or legal, or legal guardian, they'll be an unaccompanied immigrant child. If they cross with a parent or legal guardian or uh, the, the parents crossed with children under 18 years old, they're going to be considered a family unit. And a very important question is, do you have an immigration attorney, an immigration lawyer? Um, there are many agencies, and maybe in some of your agencies, you're able to connect them to legal representation, and I'm going to talk about it later, but this is going to be absolutely crucial for their immigration case. Now, this are some numbers of unaccompanied immigrant children who were apprehended at the southwest border between the fiscal year uh, 2012 and 2023. In 2014, as you can see, like the third column, uh, President Obama announced a humanitarian crisis at the border. So those numbers were already like outrageous and considered an emergency. As you can see in the following years, migration like shifted a little bit but uh, the numbers kept being pretty high 
Sorry. Para mucha gente que tiene asilo. I, I don't know if someone was someone on just muted joined. or someone just joined, so they were ah okay okay the audio. Um, thank you. Um, so these numbers. So then in 2020, because of the pandemic, the numbers went down. But during 2021, which was were we were still in the pandemic, you can see the numbers grew uh, tremendously for 2021, 2022, and then 2023, this is only until, uh, because of fiscal year, and it's from October to September, October 1st to September 30th. This is only like, in so far, the numbers are from October to last month, to April. So it is expected that these numbers are gonna at least meet, but probably go over the ones for the two previous years. And this migration, uh, I know you can see the, the countries are mostly from Guatemala, from Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, Mexico, and others. As you see, the migration from Guatemala in particular is growing more and more. Um, and the, the other, well, I'm gonna talk about the other in a second, but yeah, I'm gonna talk about it uh, now. I wanted to, so this one was for an accompanied children. And this one is showing the, the family numbers, the families, family units that are apprehended at the border. And as you see here, the highest number for unaccompanied children was almost 150,000. For families, that number is much low. I mean, families are, the numbers for families are much higher. 150,000 is like up, up to here <laughs> for last year. So. Uh, families are migrating much more than unaccompanied children. And interestingly, for me at least, is that this, this gray over here is for other. Other um, means many of them are from Venezuela, but also from Cuba, from Haiti, from Ecuador, Peru, Colombia. And this includes also families from, from uh, some countries in Africa and other places. They're, they are the minority, uh, but they, are also included here in other. Now, I'm going to talk about unaccompanied children as a whole and about family units as a whole, but it's very important to understand that there's a, a lot of diversity even within these groups. They have differentiated identities in terms of language and cultural values um, and rituals. They have very distinct experiences of discrimination, both in their country of origin and in the United States. And of course, they have very specific needs and strengths. So when I say unaccompanied children or family units, um, I do so knowing very well that there's a lot of diversity within them, but I'm gonna talk more about the experiences that they do share um, or that many of them share. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about, about their experiences. I'm, I'm gonna do so in this like four stages. First, I'm gonna talk about what happens pre-migration and in their country of origin then what happens during the migration or the journey, what happens when they're apprehended at the border, and then what happens when they are reunified or released into the community. Um, I wanna provide some context, uh, especially for uh, people coming from Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador. These three countries are considered uh, are called the Northern Triangle. So this was especially true until very recently, there started a, a migration from the other countries that I mentioned, Venezuela, Cuba, Haiti, started to increase a lot. But, but until then, it was mostly from, uh, from the Northern Triangle. Uh, and in the Northern Triangle, con uh, gangs or maras have become the most present and powerful actors in children's and families' lives. Um, I think all of them, all of my patients, for example, regardless of age, have had experiences or know of Maras or, or the gang. Like they, um, they've either ha have experiences themselves or they've had a friend or a relative that has had experiences with them. And they are very much able to identify both where they live because often they have like a specific house or they may be able to identify and just walking down the street because um, 
either because of the, the distinctive tattoos that they wear or because they are openly armed with very heavy, very heavy weaponry. Um, and so it's, they are everywhere. Um, many of the, of the people who are migrating from these countries are coming from very small towns and very impoverished areas of, of the countries. And so there are small towns where people know each other, but it's not only in small towns where, where people um, know about or are, are acquainted, let's say, with, with um, the gangs. It's also in big cities. And um, it used to be that uh, it was the insecurity, violence, and fleeing for survival rather than a more pro promising future were the reasons for people to migrate, to come and to migrate and seek asylum. Because of pandemic battered uh, economies and climate change and political unrest, the reasons why people are seeking asylum have shifted in the you know, recently. Um, but that continues to be true, like survival and, uh, and just, yeah, fleeing for their lives continues to be the main reason of why people are escaping their countries. Um, in this part where the Maras or the gangs are everywhere, there's a chronic state of lawlessness and violence is normalized. There, it's estimated that about 95% of crimes go unpunished. Um, and even though some people try to escape the situation by going to other areas, if they, let's say, receive death threats, have extremely, extremely well-oiled uh, communication networks. And, and I've had many patients who have gone from the, the time where they lived, they received threats and then they moved to another town and very soon they received threats over there, like a text message saying, we know that you moved from this town to this town and we also have eyes on you there. So very often their attempts to move, uh, like internal displacement, doesn't end with the dangers. And so they end up uh, migrating to, to the United States. Very often they have family here, um, especially people from the Northern Triangle. It's different from people from, let's say, Venezuela and other countries. Some, often they do not know anyone here. Now, why specifically, in addition to all that, why are people coming? Why are children and families migrating? These are some of the push factors. We see a lot of targeted violence toward ethnic minorities. I work with many people from the Garifuna population, from the Garifuna community. The Garifunas are an Afro-Caribbean indigenous community that is mostly in Honduras, but also a bit in Guatemala. Um, we see a lot of, I see a lot of um, targeted violence towards, towards girls and women, forcing them to become like the, the girlfriends, the girlfriends of the gang members. We see a lot of extortion, like people have, it, it's called the the tax, the war tax. Like people have to pay for security, which basically is paying to not be attacked. Um, and if they don't pay, they are attacked. So it's extortion. I see a lot of forced gang recruitment of children from a very young age. I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of lack of protection, there's corruption and impunity, uh, abject poverty. Uh, so I had a, I had a um, abject poverty and social exclusion. I want to give you an example. Uh, and this goes to the question of someone was asking what the, the, like the medical situation or circumstances are in countries of origin. This is an example that may shed some light. I had a patient who migrated when she was, I think, 16. Uh, her dad migrated when she was 10 and her mom when she was 14. At that age, she stayed in charge of her four younger siblings until she migrated. But while she was there, she, well, and to this day, she has epilepsy. Uh, they all lived in, sorry, this patient is a, is a, a female 
a patient, she's indigenous from rural Ecuador, and they all lived in extreme poverty since birth. She has epilepsy, and the, this epilepsy was untreated and undiagnosed until she arrived to the United States. When she lived in Ecuador, people in her town believed that she had a demon inside of her, that a demon had entered her body when she had seizures, and so they tried to exercise her. Uh, she had several instances of sexual abuse and discrimination and bullying for being indigenous, but also for having these demonic attacks. Uh, so in this case, for example, there was no medical services uh, that they could access. Um, we also see trafficking and, labor and both labor and sex trafficking. And as I mentioned, for new arrivals, pandemic battered economies, climate change and political unrest are important things that are a push, a important push factors, sorry. Um, now, these are some pull factors, like what's bringing them here. Number one is safe haven, like people are coming here to keep safe. They're coming to escape from dangers, from very real dangers in their countries of origin. Many of them, I'm not saying all, but many, many of them are. Uh, for unaccompanied children, they often come to reunify with their family. So I have a lot of patients, for example, who, whose parents or parents uh, migrated when they were very young, sometimes as young as one year old, um, and they stayed living in their country virgin with their grandmother or with an aunt or with a neighbor, or like with another adult. And so they have been separated for many years, sometimes for, for a decade or more. And so they, sometimes they come here also to reunify with their family. Also, there are more education and economic opportunities. And for new arrivals, one of the pull factors is uh, social media, false advertisement, and misinformation. I'm gonna come back to that specific thing in one second. This is especially true for people coming from, from Venezuela and from other countries in South America and from Haiti and, uh, in Cuba, but specifically for Venezuelans. I'm going to talk now about how they, they come about the migration. But before I do that, um, it's important to understand that there are kind of two, 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 two things, or the, the migration experience is not the same for those who are coming from Central America. Um, or let's say there's a journey and an experience um, or an array of experiences that happen one people are, once people are in Central America and they migrate up north. But there are a lot of people coming from, you know, as I mentioned, many other countries. And so they have to first get to Central America and then from Central America, they'll move up, um, they'll uh, migrate north. And the way that the people from South America m migrate, of course, I'm not talking about the people who can afford a, a plane ticket or who go other ways. Like I'm talking about people who are doing, uh, walking for most of the, of the road. Um, in a second, I'm, I'm going to talk about the specific methods of transportation, but first I want to explain like the, the, the geography of where they're coming from. So I'm going to talk about the Darien Gap or the Darien Jungle. The Darien forms um, part of the Isthmus of Panama. It's a narrow swath of land dividing the Pacific Ocean and the Caribbean Sea. Parts of it are so inaccessible that when engineers built the Pan American Highway in the 1930s, linking, linking Alaska to Argentina, only one section was left unfinished. And it's this. It's 66 roadless miles of turbulent rivers and rock mountains. And it became known as the Darien Gap. It's this, like, area that you see within the pink. So it's, it's in Panama, but it's right after the border with Colombia. And so uh, going back to, to what I had mentioned about the reasons why people migrate, uh, that for new arrivals, it was social media and false advertisement and misinformation. I want you to listen to a, to a recording, uh, to a clip uh, that explains this. So there was this uh, reporter from the New York Times, her name is Julie Turkowitz, and a photographer 
uh, named Federico Rios, and they went through this dying gap. They wanted to experience what it's like and to report the conditions and the circumstances under which people have to migrate. So this is based on their report. It's an article in the New York Times, again, by Julie Terkowitz, and the pictures by Federico Rios. Before the pictures, I wanted to listen to the description of um, kind of, uh, 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 oh, you listen. Um, but this is in, in relation to social media and false advertising. Oh, hold on. As desperation has grown around the globe, social media has become a powerful amplifier of the Dadian route. In the last year alone, Dadian related hashtags and yeah. TikTok have received more than a billion views, while Facebook groups with names like Dadian New Route to Panama have attracted hundreds of thousands of followers. Sometimes, those posting are other migrants, explaining what to bring or where to start the trek. Other posts are written by swindlers claiming that the route is not that difficult, or even that the United States is offering sanctuary to certain nationalities. Then, they try to sell their guide services. On TikTok, a company called Venators makes the trip sound like a vacation. A Venators post that was linked to a Colombian phone number reads, Four days in the jungle with responsible guides, all of Central America with VIP transport and guides plus cell phone chips so you're always in touch. Lodging, food, safe passage, 100% guaranteed. Okay, so this is like one of the advertisements, you know, what they hear. And now I want, you're going to see some pictures of the, of the Darien Gap. Um, and I want you to listen to this description of what it's like from the same reporter. The Derian Gap is a very thick jungle. The trek consists of climbing muds like mountains, crossing rivers with very strong currents where people have lost their belongings and even their lives. We saw migrants fainting from exhaustion, pushed to the point of wanting to give up completely. People don't eat much on this trip. Most people leave with maybe a bag of rice, a couple of cans of tuna. Some people, a lot of people actually, bring with them blocks of sugar that in Venezuela are called papelon. People would break off little bits and eat it to give themselves energy. By the end, most people no longer have rice or cans of tuna, and they're foraging for coconuts or sugar cane. The kids are maybe eating the little candies that their parents have brought to give them energy. There's a lot of hunger, especially towards the end, a lot of dehydration, a lot of people who are sick because they've been drinking from the rivers that are polluted with human feces, with the bodies of dead animals. You have to remember that this is a jungle that has no services for people. There's no bathrooms and there's no trash cans. It's a region that's known for flash storms. You'll be walking and suddenly it will begin to rain and you'll have only moments to grab some kind of cover. The thing is, you become so wet that a rain jacket, a poncho, it just becomes trouble. It, the rain soaks through. People typically just keep going in the rain until the rivers become too full that it becomes dangerous, and then they climb up into the hills and try and hike through the hills. There's a lot of climbing up and then down these steep hills. They do so while well, they going through. They have to go down a mountain called La Loma de la Muerte, which means the Hill of Death. The mood is definitely more solemn. The hike is definitely much harder. Very, very muddy hills. You slip, slip, slip. We had missed. So as you can see, there's a huge difference between what's advertised and what it actually is. Um, Venezuelans are both particularly attached to technology and also more likely to trust what they see online related to the decline of traditional media under the current government. So they trust TikTok much more than the official news. And this is some of the messages that they're receiving 
um, from from social media. Um, I I don't know if you can see the picture. What the girl is holding is her pet turtle, which I found very endearing. Like people go there with their most you know precious belongings and whatever they have in that moment or whatever they think they will be able to carry. But many migrants set out with no understanding of the terrain, the geography, or social conflict that lay ahead of them. It has grown into a multi-million dollar migrant business, of course. Uh, migrants are, are met by smugglers, which are typically poor men in the area who offer to take them into the jungle, starting at $250 a person. For an extra 10, they'll carry a backpack, and for an extra 30, a child. The government is largely absent from the Darien. The area is controlled by a criminal group known as the Clan del Golfo, whose members view migrants much as they view drugs, groups that they can tax and control. Uh, there are many, many bodies have been found uh, in the in the Darien, and some and many more they probably just have not probably they, they have not been found, but because um, it's surrounded by these rivers, if a child, let's say, falls in the river, there's nothing anyone can do. Um, the river will take the child away because the currents are really strong. So it's extremely, extremely dangerous. Uh, just last year, more than 200, I think it was like 250,000 people crossed the Darien. Um, at least, I think there were like 40,000 children and at least like 700 uh, children arrived at the end of the route without their parents. Um, and not because they left alone, but because they lost them along the way. Um, okay, so so this is the, the Darien. Now, if everything works out well, like in the best case scenario, people arrive to the, they cross the Darien and they get to South America, to Central America alive and they survived all that. So now I'm gonna talk about the experience of migrating from Central America. Um, the way that, that people migrate, that people come, is it's around a 2,000 mile um, journey. And the methods of transportation are by bus. They do a lot of walking, car rides, and uh, they go through this train called La Bestia, or the train of death, or the beast, because uh, where there's a constant risk of falling off and mutilation. Um, the journey is frequently characterized by harsh and life-threatening experience. I often hear of all of this listed here, um, and of sexual assault and robberies and exposure to the elements, extreme heat, extreme cold, kidnapping, both by competing drug cartels but, and by others. Um, and keep in mind that those who are migrating from, let's say, different countries in Africa, they have even more of a, of a hardship. They have to first come to Central or South America. And very often, for some reason, they migrate to Ecuador. I think it's because they don't have, like, Ecuador probably has like easy, they maybe don't need a visa. But many people who come from different countries in Africa migrate to Ecuador first and then make the journey to the north. Okay, so um, after surviving all that, oh, and some, well, some cross with a coyote or a smuggler and some don't cross, but I'm going to get to that in a second. So after surviving all of that, some of them, so let's say that they survived all of that, they survived the kidnapping, they survived, they survived everything, they get to the border with the United States. And some of them present themselves at the port of entry to express their fears of harm if returned to their home country. Um, I was a few years ago, in right before the pandemic started, uh, as Ansi mentioned, I, I collaborated with the ACLU in their federal litigation by doing mental health evaluations of people who were, who were um, stranded at the border. Um, and so um, I want to show you a, a video first. So th the video you're going to see is a video that I took of um, people making the line 
at this port of entry. I want you to have an idea of what a port of entry is. Maybe you already know, I did not before. I've been seeing it with my hands. Ah. But it's the same entry for cars that are there. But you can see there the migrants making the line to try to to try to come in. Uh, and so some would um, some would go would show up at the port of entry and say I need asylum because of this and this and that. And sometimes they would be just turned away. They're like no, today we don't have any space. Come back another day. Or sometimes they would give them, especially with Title 42, they had uh, many were turned away with the excuse of national public health emergency because of, of COVID. Um, and so they were turned away or they were given numbers, like yeah, a turn or a number, but they would be made to wait in the Mexican side of the border in this uh, migrant camps. I was personally in these migrant camps and there are many words that I can that I can use to describe, but spooky is definitely one of them. It they are places in very bad condition. They are gang infested. People are living in extreme fear, uh, and they're living in if they're lucky in tents. And if they're lucky in tents, but many don't have a tent. They're waiting for someone to leave so they can have their tent or their their belongings. And so some of, some people would get desperate after being in this condition or they're running out of money or they're sick or, or they have children who, one of the people that I, that I evaluated when I was at the border was a mom who had two young kids. They had already kidnapped them along the way. And when they were here at the migrant camp, they, uh, they tried to kidnap her son. She became so desperate that the next day she made the, the harrowing and just incredibly difficult decision to actually send her kids on her own to cross the border because that was the only way that she found that she she felt that she, they would be more protected even if they weren't with her but away from those from the camp than if they stayed with her so this is to give you an idea of what those camps look like okay so this was what was happening and it's probably what continues to happen. However, I want to talk very briefly about the new asylum ban. This is very new, so I don't really know exactly how things are gonna change, but I wanna tell you, at least in theory, what the new asylum ban that I'm, I imagine some of you have heard of, have heard of brings to the table. It's supposed to be uh, in effect since uh, May 11th. So it's really, really like it's brand new. Um, the, the new asylum ban allows for rapid deportation, so expedited removal of anyone who, number one, presents at a port of entry, but without an appointment made through the CBP-1 app. I'm gonna talk about the app in one second. Or anyone who crosses the border between ports of entry. So this is like they're crossing the, the wall or they're crossing just between the ports of entry, the official ports of entry without having requested and being denied asylum from another country while en route to the United States. So it used to be that they cross the border and they're apprehended, and then they get an opportunity to talk about, you know, about why they're scared of going back to, to their country, and there would be um, a credible fear interview, and then the asylum officer or the, the immigration officer would decide whether to let them in or not. But now with this new asylum ban is and it, it wants to make it almost automatic. You cross the border and you didn't request and get denied asylum from Mexico or from Guatemala or from the, any other country that you crossed along the way, then you're deported and uh, you are blocked from seeking asylum for five years. This is for people who cross between the, between the ports of entry. Uh, and as I mentioned, also to those who come to the port of entry, so like the people who were in line trying to request asylum, that is no longer an option with this new ban. So they have to make an appointment through an app. And you would think, well, what 
yeah, we can just download the app and make the appointment there. It's not, of course, it's not the way that it works with this app for this population. The app they're supposed to make this appointment through is called CBP1. And there are a lot of problems with this app. Number one, it requires not only the app, but just any app for them to use. It requires a smartphone. Uh, it requires internet access and the ability to read English, Spanish, or Haitian Creole. And this is a problem because an increasing number of migrants speak languages beyond those available in the app, including uh, Mayan languages and, and uh, Russian. And many people are illiterate. So it is very difficult for them to access this app. This app also requires a live photo security check, which does not consistently recognize the fa facial features of darker skinned people. So this is, of course, extremely racist. They, if they, they, people who have darker skin, they take the picture and it's, the app doesn't take it, doesn't accept it, doesn't recognize it. Um, each member of a family has to get an appointment slot. So let's say there's a family of five, but they're just four slots. The whole family cannot get a slot because each one of them needs to get a slot. And so what this is causing is, what this is gonna um, create is family separation because if there's, let's say, let's say in the best case scenario, there are two adults and it's a family of five. Uh, instead of them acting and doing everything as a family of five, one adult is gonna say, is gonna try to access the app and say, okay, we're a family of three. And then the other parent, we're a family of two. Um, there are parents, two parents uh, coming in. And so in any case, this causes family separation. And at any given point in time, there are around 100,000 people attempting to register for the approximately seven or 800 slots available each day. So it's, 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 it's almost impossible. Basically, the CBP1 app turns the legal right to asylum into a lottery. One you can only play if you have the right amount of money, pay for the phone and internet connection or reliable cellular data, uh, speak the right language and have the right skin tone. In some, the new asylum ban has a lot of problems. Okay, now I, I'm, I'm gonna go back into, into um, I, I was mentioning that people go to the ports of entry or they cross, when they get desperate, they cross uh, between ports of entry. So not, the two ports of entry is just a way of saying that it's not through the official way. They come uh, through the desert, well, they come through this. So when they get desperate, uh, they come through the river and the desert. There are an estimated 750 deaths per year recorded by dehydration and or drowning uh, crossing the border. And if they're lucky, they don't die. But examples of things that I hear from my patients all the time is that they hear and feel animals in the middle of the night. They're walking for days at a time. They're seeing bones and dead bodies, just like in a horror movie. And all of them are terrified of the animals in the river and of drowning. Even uh, even though many of them do know how to swim, because remember, many come from uh, from Honduras and Guatemala from the coast, so many of them do know how to swim, but even they are um, afraid of drowning. Now, once they go through all that, if they don't drown, if they make it alive to the other side of the river and the desert, uh, they are typically apprehended right away. It's either the, the migra, the border patrol, or la migra sees them and apprehends them, or sometimes they look for border patrol right away and turn themselves in, not only because uh, they will receive water and food and maybe uh, and shelter, but also sometimes they are very sick or they have sick kids, and, um, and so they're going to receive some things to, to survive. Like many of them fear that they're going to die if they don't. And very importantly, also, this is going to create a record that they enter the country, that they enter the country. It's, and that's going to be important for later on for the immigration uh, case. Importantly, for unaccompanied children, um, there's going to be a record that they crossed the border before they were, they were 18 years old. And that is going to allow them um, a more chances of getting immigration relief later on. Okay, so they're, they're apprehended. 
they, after they're apprehended, they're taken to this place called La Yelera because of the freezing temperatures or La Ferrera, so often not because it looks like one. This is the first placement they go after apprehension. And children and, and adults are, are first all together and then they are separated. Um, most patients have reported that in addition to the freezing temperatures, there are bright lights on the ceiling and they stay on at all times. So it's very hard to get any sleep or to know whether it's day or night. Uh, there are no windows. It's very hard to get any sleep. Uh, the, food, the, the floor is hard and cold. The cell is very crowded. There's no privacy at all. Children are crying and coughing all night long. Uh, the food is, is bad. Sorry, my computer is very old and that's what I want. Um, the, the food is bad and scarce and there's lack of medical care. Many of the examinations are conducted of the of the medical examinations are conducted by law enforcement officers rather than by medical doctors. And they're frequently limited to checking for lice, scabies, and chickenpox. And they're gonna stay here between two and four days before they are transferred. It is in this processing centers that asylum seekers get their first chance at telling their story, at explaining what they're fleeing, why why they migrated. So this is like their big opportunity. However, because of cumulative and complex trauma, which I'm gonna talk about in the second section, both children and adults are often very afraid of sharing their stories. They're, they are used to not being able to, able to trust authorities and much less those in uniform. Um, many of them are scared that the information they disclose will get back to their communities. As I mentioned, the gangs have extremely well-oiled communication networks. And so they are used to not being able to say things because you know, it gets communicated very quickly. And so they are scared of endangering those that they left behind, their friends or their communities or their families. They're afraid that they, if they say something, there is gonna be reper repercussions back home. Um, and because of trauma, sometimes there are discrepancies in their telling. So there, there may be some contradictions, but this is not because they're lying. This is not because they didn't experience what they're saying that they experienced usually, um, but it's because of trauma, because how trauma can negatively impact um, what, you know, the way people communicate. And it's, it's really dangerous because it's like, this is their chance. Uh, this is a chance for an immigration officer to get, to say, okay, I, I believe that you may have reason to be scared or to be, yeah, it's called the credible fear interview. So I believe that you may have reasons to be, to have credible fear. So I'm going to let you go through the rest of the process in the United States. Or if they don't believe them, they're going to be deported right away. And so it's important for them, for people to be able to communicate the reason why they're there in a clear way, but trauma may get in the way of that. Okay, so if they're not deported, if they are believed to have a credible fear, they are going to, um, families or adults with children are gonna be sent to, usually together uh, to detention centers and released within a few days, uh, or are gonna be released from the processing centers in a few days and they're gonna be placed in detention centers. Uh, typically for less than a month. They're gonna remain together, usually. Which is not what happened, what would happen under zero tolerance policy under the Trump administration. They would separate them, but now they, um, usually they allow them to stay together. That That's with families, family units. Now, with unaccompanied children, they're gonna be sent to these shelters of the Office of Refugee Resettlement. And it's important that it's part of ORR because ORR is part of human and health services. So it's child welfare, no longer the Department of Homeland Security. So there's a shift in the people who work in these places and how um, like they're trained to working with kids. Um, the children are gonna stay here while there's an investigation going on on the potential sponsor that they can be released to. They, the sponsor is gonna have done, um, they have to do a background check on the sponsor and on everyone who 
lives with the sponsor. One question I often get is whether they have to, uh, whether immigration status matters for these cases. And the answer is no. The person can be undocumented, a sponsor can be undocumented. But of course, sometimes they are scared too that now the government is gonna know that they're here. And very often they don't, like very often they were never apprehended and they're just like under the radar. And now they're gonna become like on the, on the radar in a way, but, but no, um, it doesn't matter if they are undocumented, they can still be sponsors. Uh, and usually this is not a risk, like in practice, this is not a risk for them to be, a, to be deported. But sometimes it's difficult to understand that or to feel that as a sponsor. So they, they're gonna stay in these dorm style rooms and um, you know, they have shared bathrooms, showers, clothes, hot meals, education, uh, and recreation activities. And they also receive medical and mental health care while in custody. Um, the experiences here really vary. I have patients who have hated it there. It also depends on the kind of place, the kind of shelter that they go to. For example, there are some um, abandoned Walmarts who that have been used as shelters and they don't have windows and it's just a huge place and a lot of people don't like it there, understandably so. But I have had also other uh, patients who, you know, this place allows them to have at least three meals a day with bathrooms inside the premises with adults looking after them with them with the possibility of making friends and just being with other with other kids and for some they don't like this is very different from the circumstances they have they had at home so i've had many when i work with my with my patients i explore their experience in the different parts of the of the migration journey um, and I also experience their, I also explore their experience at the shelters. And sometimes when I ask what, what was the worst part about the shelter, the answer that I have gotten was uh, the worst part was having to leave the shelter. But of course, again, this is not a generalized experience. Everyone has their own experience, but it really varies by, by, by person and by where they were. Okay, so now, they lived in this, they, they were at the shelter, the sponsor was investigated and was approved. Now the sponsor has to send money or to buy the transportation for the child. It can be a bus, right? It can be a plane ticket. And if the sponsor doesn't have the money, it means that either they're gonna have to borrow it or uh, the child is gonna wait a little longer there. So. Um, you know, this is this is also um, an argument could be made on discrimination based on financial resources because the child has to be there uh, until the family gets the money. So, who are the sponsors? You may be asking yourselves, and I'm going to tell you the many of them are the parents, the biological parents. This is especially true for unaccompanied children who are coming from Honduras. Not so much for the ones who are coming from Guatemala, for example. In particular, Guatemalans very often come to reunite with an older sibling um, or with a cousin. But a sponsor can be anyone, anyone willing to take care of them and to provide for them. Uh, so sometimes these are the sponsor is someone that the that the child had met before or is a relative, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's like the sister of the cousin of the great aunt who is doing the favor and who you know they have never met um or or sometimes it's the aunt that yes it's the biological aunt but they've never met in person because the aunt migrated before the child was born and so so this really um this really varies and of course the kind of relationship is gonna have an impact on adaptation um and adjustment later on uh, all, every single state in the United States has received unaccompanied immigrant children, all. Um, okay, so 
now that they are with this sponsor, uh, they are released and they're now with this new sponsor. It's kind of uh, a new life begins or a new stage of life. Now, I want you to um, share, what do you think are some of the stressors that children face in this new part of their, of their journey, in their new life in the community? You can write it in the chat or unmute yourselves. What stressors do children encounter now that they are living in New York City? They arrived. What's happening with them? We have some answers coming in in the chat. Anxiety separation, yes. New rules, language, grief. Language barriers, PTSD, anxiety, depression, culture shock, loneliness, language barriers. They don't know their sponsors. All of these are absolutely true. Social isolation, adjusting to a new school, sense of loss, depression, unknown. Absolutely. Maybe guilt if they left family behind. Yes, low self-esteem. Yes, 100% all of this are true. Thank you for participating. Um, yes, first we have the reunification with, the, with um, the family or the sponsor, um, which can be challenging. Uh, because of the reasons that some of you said and, and what I had said before, like the, the they may not have a relationship, and so it's it's going to be a huge adjustment. With specifically for children who are reuniting with their biological parents, um, or with their parents, um, yeah, they don't have to be their biological parents, but with parents whom they grew up with in their country of origin, with them as parents, um. They, we often see something that we call the honeymoon period. When they first arrive, it's like, oh my God, I love you. You love me. We're finally back together. We can be a family. We can just be so happy and everything's going to be great. And we love each other. And this was my dream for so long. Yes, mine too. Everything's going to be great. And it is until it isn't. And that honeymoon period, very often lasts maybe three weeks or a month, um, and then conflicts start to to arise. Um, some some you know it, it's gonna depend on many different things like the year, the, the number of years they were apart, what kind of communication they had, if they had any communication when they were away, um, if they what kind of relationship like was their attachment or was there was the attachment continued to be um uh, fostered or uh, was the relationship just about sending money i've seen many examples of both of those so some parents keep constant communication and are very present in their children's lives even from afar it's like their version of helicopter parenting so for example i have i had a patient who uh, she was going before coming to New York, she um, lived in El Salvador and she had, let's say she had a, a party at night. She had to call her mom in New York to request permission to go to the party. And so, and this is, this is pretty common. I also have many other patients who no, they spoke to their parents maybe once a month or once every two months, and it was just like, hi, how are you? Good, okay, bye. Like there was no real bonding or attachment, or you know, and those things are gonna have an a strong impact in in the adjustment now that they're living together again. Um, 
sometimes the communication is difficult in these countries of origin. Very often, there aren't the means to have communication like we do in New York City in 2023. There are a lot of houses usually don't have internet, but not only that, in many towns, there isn't good, reliable um, cell phone networks and or people don't have the resources to buy a, you know to pay for their phone so very often it's people here sending money back there so that they are able to pay for a phone line a, another very important thing that i found well, I don't know what i found but uh some things that i often see and that give way to this conflict uh, after they're here is that sometimes unaccompanied children come to the united states and reunite with their with their parents and sometimes they come to their new house to find out that they have younger siblings that they were unaware of. So it's like, hi, um, Josefina, this meet your seven-year-old sister, Maria, who you had no idea that existed. And so as you can imagine, this can be pretty shocking and pretty difficult for some, for many. Um, Number one, that they were that this was kept from them, but also that these younger siblings have the, the privilege of growing up with their parents and, and the unaccompanied child did not. So that can make adaptation even more difficult. There are also stressors already in the household, like financial stress, food and housing insecurity. Uh, caregivers may be fearful of being deported themselves. There's carried over trauma, so not only what they what they experience in their country of origin, but everything that I mentioned during the journey. Um, acculturation, as many mentioned in the chat, there's uh, a, a big shift. They have to adapt to a completely different lifestyle, to wear different clothes, to new weather, new food, different languages, uh, language and rules. Um, they have a lot of restrictions on on uh, freedom. They used to, many used to play outside a lot in their countries of origin. And here, often they're allowed to go from school to home and from home to school, and, and that's it. Uh, because often the sponsors or the parents are afraid of getting in trouble. And, and what I have, yeah, I don't know, just uh, they're afraid of getting in trouble. They, they have to navigate a, a new school system that is very often difficult to navigate. Sometimes they stop going to school in their country of origin either because they couldn't afford it or because even public schools they have to pay, either they couldn't afford it or um, because of threats or issues with the gangs, they stop going to school. So sometimes they come to New York and they arrive with gaps in their schooling. Sometimes they stopped going to school three years ago. And so there's gaps in their schooling, but they're going to be placed usually according to their age, not to their, to their school level. Uh, isolation and lack of, lack of community, I mentioned, they spend a lot of time alone in their rooms. There's a lot of isolation, and we know that part of like, normal development is being able to socialize and to, to develop social skills at school. A lot of discrimination and a lack of sense of belonging, discrimination, both from country of origin, but also here. And you know, it's this can include bullying and hostility. Survivors guilt is or carriers of hope is not so much for the ones who are reuniting with parents, but for especially for those who are um, who are not for unaccompanied children. A, who are living with a sponsor. Sometimes they are uh, the only hope for the family that they left back home. Sometimes, you know, not everybody makes it along the journey. A lot of people die in the way. And so it's like them not only being the ones who, who attempted the journey, but also the ones who made it, they feel a lot of responsibility to care for the family that was left behind. And so Sometimes it's them pressuring themselves to start working and make money so that they can send money back home. But very, very often it's the family back home also pressuring them into working. So they're like, I don't care that, yeah, I don't care that you're 14 or 16 years old. And you went there to, you, you have to start working 
to you can go there to to study if you want there to work so please start working and start sending us money fortunately for their immigration case they must be in school so but all of this to say that they do get a lot of pressure from the family platform um, repayment of family debt it's very expensive to to come here they have to pay usually the coyote and, and a lot of things along the way uh, legal system there both the children and adults are afraid of being deported and they have to find an attorney themselves uh, i'm going to talk about the attorney situation the legal case in one second and just in case you're desperate for a break we are two slides away um okay now please share what you think are the stressors for adults for the adults who are coming with their children for family units No stressors, everything is great. It's an easy life. Seeing their children in pain, survivor's guilt, anxiety, unemployment, financial shelter, food, employment, healthcare. Absolutely. Adults want to get their children accepted. Yes. Feeling impotency for lack of power or access to keep the family safe. Frustration, anxiety, depression, financial home insecurity. Absolutely. Thank you very much for participating. Yes, all of those are true. Uh, I'm going to start with surprises in relational resources. Many come here thinking that uh, where to live safely, yes. Many come here thinking, not only thinking, but under the premise that they'll be able to stay with their sister, with their aunt, with a cousin who offered them um, shelter for a few days or for, for a little bit. Yeah, come stay with me. Yes, you're welcome. Um, and very often, I can't tell you how 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 often I get I hear these stories. Very often, they get to surprises. They they what they thought was going to happen is definitely not what actually happens. Like sometimes they come here, and uh, I've had patients who the person who was going to support them never picks up the phone. Never picks up the phone. So they are here um alone and with, you know with no thinking that they're gonna come into this house with this person who's gonna help them and they just they disappear they completely disappear they go from there um they um or others who you know they and this happens also with biological uh family i just yesterday just yesterday a um, patient was sharing with me that she hadn't seen her father in a really long time and that because he migrated when she was very young and that when she first arrived to new york she was so excited to go and see her her dad um and that uh this patient's sister who had been living here for for a while before the sister told the dad oh guess what my sister is coming here and dad's reaction was like she better not be expecting anything from me. I'm not gonna pay for anything. I'm not gonna care. You know, and so there are this. Uh, sometimes people come with these expectations that things are gonna go one way, and they are absolutely different to what they expect. Um, also, fear separation from family and children, especially if they were uh, separated along the way, like I mentioned in the in the Darien jungle they were separated but also in any other at, at any other point along the way uh, or 
if they were separated during uh, zero tolerance policy, for example, I have I worked with uh, families who were separated under the zero tolerance policy, and there's still this it's like a chip that was inserted in them of fear of being separated again. Of course, it was something extremely traumatic. Um, another stressor is, of course, supporting their children. They have to work, they have to feed them, and initially they don't have a lot of rights or a lot of access to benefits. And they, have, they don't have work authorization, so it's not like they can just go and start working right away. And there are, the fines are increasing more every time for employers who employ um, undocumented migrants and people without work authorization. So it's much harder now than it was 10 years ago and much more than it was 20 years ago to find work. This is not to say that people don't find it. A lot of people do find it, but it's, it's harder. And also it leads to a lot of labor exploitation. I have a lot of patients who have gone for example, uh, gone to work for construction um, and they are told, okay, you're gonna work the first week and it's gonna be training. And when they, or the first two weeks, it's gonna be training. And then after that, we'll start paying you. And so they work this two weeks and then after the two weeks, they're like, oh, no, sorry, we don't need you. This happens all the time, all the time. And people are scared to do anything wrong, so they don't, you know, they don't know their rights very often. And even if they do, they don't feel comfortable enough um, demanding them because they're afraid of a lot of things. Um, housing is an issue, as many mentioned, language, stigma, uh, racism and discrimination. Just to get just to ask with the kids, um, lack of insurance or health care. If they in New York, if they're under 18 years old, they are um, insured, but this is only true in like six states in the whole of the United States. Um, but this is for children who are under 18 years old. For adults, this is not the case. Sometimes they are eligible for like emergency care, like medical care, um, but it's, it's, a, it's a, an issue. They are also constantly afraid of being deported themselves and they need to get a lawyer too. They need to get a lawyer, okay. So I'm gonna, this is the last slide before the break. Uh, I mentioned that both kids and adults uh, have to find an attorney. So all apprehended children and adults are placed in court proceedings to determine whether they will be eligible for legal relief that will allow them to lawfully stay in the, the United States. But the burden is on them. They have to prove that they are eligible. The most common forms of relief that I see uh, are asylum, which is for people, children or adults who are persecuted in their home country on the basis of their identity as part of a particular social group. And <clears throat> for children, there's also the special immigrant juvenile status, also known as SIGE, which is for children who have been abused, abandoned, or neglected by one or both parents, either in their country of origin or the United States. And this includes uh, a child whose parent, like it can be one of the parents died, that will be considered like uh, abandoned um, for, this, for, this, um, for this purpose. So they may be eligible for seeds. Um, I also see cases with T visas, which are for people who have been trafficked into the United States or after arriving to the United States become the victims of human trafficking, or U visas, who are for people who are victims of crimes and help uh, police in their investigation of the crime. So they don't have the right to a government appointed counsel. They must find they must represent themselves in court or find themselves an attorney. How do they find it? There is a large network of pro bono attorneys, but it's never enough. The demand is much, much higher than the offer. And very often attorneys take only the strongest cases. So it's really difficult to find counsel and it's more difficult each day. And legal representation matter matters a lot. Like they will have much, much, much more chances of winning asylum or whatever immigration relief they may be eligible for if they are represented by an attorney. And they'll have between 
five to 10 court hearings over a two to four year period until a final outcome. There are huge delays. And I would say also, I'm not sure exactly what it depends on, but I have patients who've been here for seven years and whose case has not been resolved. And I have others who've been here for a year and they have their final hearing in a month. So it's a big mess. It depends on the judge, it depends on the system, it depends, you know, uh, COVID came and like shook everything up and it's already a pretty complex system. And, and I think it's, uh, yeah, it's complex and, and a bit difficult to, to understand. Okay, we got to the break. Please take, uh, what is this? Take, uh, like a seven or eight minute break. Um, I'll see you here at six. To start at three, um, three at 35, 10 35 on the dot, maybe a couple of minutes before. See you soon. For those of you who are joining us for continuing education credits, if you're here, um, you know, where as a social worker, a mental health professional, please note that I uh, have dropped the registration link for the continuing education credits in the chat. I also noticed that there's um, several folks who I believe are joined under someone else's name. So I just want to note that if you do want professional credit for attending, um, I've just reopened the registration link. So please uh, register under your email so that we can um, document that, that you are here and validate your attendance. Um, just want to make sure that those who need credit for this course are, are getting it. So please register for it at that link if you can. And let me know if you have any questions or are having issues uh, with, with registering there. Yes, unfortunately, we have to, to create an account so that they can have all of your necessary uh, info to, to go ahead and contact. Um, but this would be, if we host any other continuing education credit opportunities in the future, this will be the mechanism through which we um, issue the credits. So, you know, if you, if you register now and attend in the future, this would be the only time you'll have to register.
Okay, everybody, welcome back. It's 10.35, we still have a lot to do. Um, we're going to, we're gonna start this section with, um, I just wanna acknowledge also that it's a lot of information. Uh, so I hope you do whatever you need to do. And I should have said this before the break, but whatever you need to do to take care of yourself, uh, I encourage you to, to do some stretches, to do some walking around, some um, focused breaths. Um, but yeah, this is heavy stuff. So we're gonna continue. We're going to start the section with a uh, uh, case. I want you to, we're gonna divide you in uh, breakout rooms and um, We're gonna divide you in, yes, in breakout rooms. And um, I want you to please discuss this case, which um, you're gonna have on your chat too. Uh, I want you to discuss like amongst yourselves and think and discuss the case and the questions that we're also gonna add on the, on the chat box so that you have them. And if you can, please select someone from your group to come back and share some of the results uh, with the rest of us. So I can divide them in groups. All right, I just have opened the breakout rooms. So I believe anybody who, yeah, you can now go ahead and join your breakout groups. And if you need some help navigating there, there's on the um, the bar along the bottom, if you click more, it will show that there's one of the options there is breakout rooms and you can um, see the different room assignments, find yourself and you can just click join and that will allow you to join the breakout sessions. It looks like most folks have been able to join. Uh, I'm going to go, Brenda, and um, distribute the, the info to all the groups. So um, if you want to stay here for a minute. Well, I... Do you want me to do something? Sorry? Do you need me to do something? Um, just, you know, if any other folks that are here um, need assistance joining a room, just... Uh, I just admitted someone. How do okay. I send them to? Um, um, I can assign. I'll, I'll assign them right now. Okay. And if somebody else comes, um, essentially, I'm not sure if you can see. Rooms? Mm -hmm. ah, and yeah. okay. the top, there's the unassigned, and we can assign them there. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Hi. Hi. So we're a little confused. We're in the room. We don't know how much time we have. And That's cool. That you, yeah, we're supposed to have 10 minutes, but we're going to bring you back. Okay, 10 minutes. 10 minutes. And the case, we didn't all look at it correctly <laughs> for long enough. What no, are we? No, no, it's supposed to be on your chat. That's Ansley. what I thought, that it would yeah. have been, but we didn't see it. So, okay, Ansley is going now to. Uh, to the room yeah to the room to put it in the to paste it in the okay. and i am let me go back to that room we just i think it was seven can you do that on your own or do i have to do something you might have to be the one because um we're not sharing here <laughs> let's see same for me i was in room four okay hold on this i don't see okay. Yeah, no, I can, I can go back. You can?
magic food, but I don't know how. Uh, do you know how to, Marjorie, do you know how to go back? No. I, when I left the break room, I had the option of leaving the whole meeting or leaving the break room. But right now I press leave and it only gives me the option to leave completely. I'm trying to, to look. Yeah, we had the same question. We 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 didn't see it in the chat. Um, let's see. Um, it's okay. I can also wait. No, you know what? Can you go out and come back in? Because I think that way I am able to put you somewhere. Like okay. I think I'll do that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you too. Ah. Did it work? Oh, you were in room seven. I just figured how. I thought it was in room four. Four. Okay. Okay. So you, uh, I think. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. You're Hi. I'm going to the room just to let people know how long.
thank you very much, uh, Antonio hey, Ambrosio. We're gonna we're going to have a discussion because I want okay. other teams to to see what you got to. So you, you don't need us to put it on the chat. We'll we'll talk no. about it, right? Not for now. Okay. Thank yeah. you. No, thank you. Okay, welcome back, everybody. I hope you were. Thank you. Were, thank you. I hope you were able to communicate and to meet your fellow attendees. Um, okay, so I'm interested in um, seeing what it was like. I'm gonna put the page back up. Okay. Uh, who wants to share? Let's go through the first, the first um, question. What do you see as the main needs or challenges of the family? There, you all got the same, the same um, case exactly, precisely, so that we could discuss together. So, any volunteers to start sharing your answers? 
I, I can go. Thank you. Um, so we met at our group, and so we were taking a look at the um, case sample. And one of the first things that jump at our um, um, has the, one of the first needs would be to do a mental health assessment or screening, um, and uh, making sure that she has the resources that she needs. You know, since she's you know talking about um, depression and suicide. So I think that was one of the first things. And then right next to it would be housing, making sure that the um, that she has proper housing for her and the two kids. Um, so I think that's one of the first things that we looked at, um, making sure that she does have housing, appropriate housing, and she has um, uh, connections to a mental screening. Um, and of course, right after that would be making sure that the family has um, services, uh, making sure that she's linked to either um, pantry places where she can get food um, and assistance. Um, the other thing that we were looking at is um, assessing whether or not she entered the United States with um, legally with uh, parole or if or she came in uh, undocumented, right? Um, and then if that's the case, um, if she did come um, asking for asylum, making sure that she has connections to um, agencies or places where they can help her with the asylum application. Thank you very much. So first, mm -hmm. tending to her mental health needs, making sure she has an assessment and connecting her with mental health um, resources, depending on the assessment, uh, connecting her to housing and to assessing her, her status and her need for uh, potentially an immigration attorney or for legal resources. And, and other sorts of resources. Thank you very much. That is all absolutely appropriate. Are there other groups who want to add to this question? And I just dropped the questions in the chat for everyone's reference as well. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'll add a little bit. So my name is Maria Palacios. I work with Catholic Charities um, of Fairfield County. I'm not a social worker um, and I'm not a therapist, but I wanted to join this training just to get a little bit more background on, you know, I have a lot of clients who come to us and uh, they've obviously have crossed the border and it's really nice to understand a little bit more of the trauma that's going through to better assess um, their abilities to apply for asylum and things like that. Um, and so what we discussed in our group was um, yes, assessing um, the, the different um, mental uh, you know, issues that they might be going through, but how hard it could be for the mom to even search for that resource like you know okay I'm going through all these things but I'm new to this country but how do I get that help um and you know there's a lot of states that do have resources but if clients don't know how to reach those resources it's not like it's like they weren't even there and so uh, you know we discuss about how like you know it's advertisement but it's a lot of word of mouth on how we clients come to us and how they seek our services um but yeah, and also like we talked about, you know, the language barrier and, you know, that could be a, a, a reason for why they might not seek our services or, um, and um, so it's like, it's hard, we can't assess clients unless they find us first. Um, but yeah, I think that that's it for that question for now. Thank you very much. I hope this is very helpful. Does any do any other anyone else from another team want to add? I had a question about what um the previous uh speaker said. Um he said like resources to housing. I'm just using it as to get ideas. Um are you guys are is are you guys having um easy time finding housing for new arrivals? Because we're having a really hard time here because Connecticut has like no housing. 
uh, and it's so expensive. So it's it just, it was an interesting point because yes, housing is very important. And that obviously is if you have nowhere to live, that carries a huge burden on your mental health. Um, so I was just intrigued by it. I was like, wow, are you having a, like luck finding housing for a new arrival? Because I'm not, and I need yeah. And I like the way that you, I like the way that you put it. If we're having an easy time, I don't think anyone is having an easy time doing anything. But um, yeah, I think housing is really it is really difficult. It's the system is really really overwhelmed. Um, and so yeah, we have families that are going to pass. And some so now I think it's getting a little bit better. But I had uh, families who stayed there for two nights with three kids under ten sleeping there for two nights. Um, and so eventually they do uh, find something, uh, even if it's just temporarily. And then, you know, they have to go through the process to see if they're eligible and, and all of that. But no, it's not easy. It's the resources are really, really scarce. Thank you for your question. I have a quick question, um, Brenda. Since um, the the resources are very limited, what happens to them when they get here? I mean, what is happening? And this is where I'm a little confused. Like, how do they get the resources? Who is actually connecting them to these resources? Well, it really depends. Many of my patients, for example, are getting connected to me and to my medical clinic through word of mouth. Also through uh, their attorneys or their social workers or their, their um, yeah, other agencies. But it's very often through word of mouth that they get connected to one and then from then, from there, they'll get connected to other things, to other services. They not have the ones that are coming without knowing anyone, especially Venezuelans. Right, uh, more difficult because they don't have the support networks to help them in that in that way. And I hope that that's what we're trying to do. Right, is trying to set up the programs where people will have access to these resources and not just depend on word of mouth, because then we're not really reaching all of them, and we should be trying to reach all of them. Yes, that, that would be ideal. I'm sure there are some programs, and there are some programs uh, who do a lot of uh, community outreach, for example. Mm -hmm. and so they, they have, they are in the field, they are in the streets, they, are, they have the contact with this uh, population. And when I say word of mouth, it's, just, it's word of mouth about, let's say, an agency, and then that agency may connect them to other agencies. But, you know, the, they have to start somewhere. And... Um, yeah, sometimes it's the shelter, and at the shelter, then they're connected to other things. It really, it really varies. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to get um, back to the case, because we're running out of time. Um, what areas, well, there was already a mention of what areas you would assess further, or what questions would you ask? Um, uh, what strengths can you identify? in this case. Anna, you're muted, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, one of the strengths, and I find that I've been working with asylum seekers for about 10 years now, and one of their strengths, the most resilient thing about them is especially the women, um, and just like this Honduran woman, has the strength and the resilience to see my children are in trouble. I don't want them to be in trouble. I will do anything for them. And she gets up and goes and travels a thousand miles to get them to safety. Mm -hmm. That is one case, but it's not one case. It's thousands of cases. I have been doing this for 10 years. And most of the people I have seen are women with children. And most of the cases I have seen, it's domestic violence because the partner is abusing mother and children 
or gang violence because the gangs want to take the children, the boys to take things for them, the girls as their brides. And the mothers do not want their children to suffer that indignity. And so they bring them up. So their resilience is astounding. And that to me is just, you know, it's worth working with them. It's worth all the pain and agony that we go through with them because they have been through hell and they've gotten here. And then what little bit we can do, I try to do to connect them to different places. And again, as you said, with word of mouth, that is word of mouth. I mean, we have a website, but they're not used to websites. They're not used to that. So I have this one girl that was from this settled in this one town everyone now who goes to that town calls us calls me because she has told so and so so and so has told so and so etc etc the whole town the immigrants there call me and call our organization because they know that we will help them um they also know of all the other organizations, but some of them, a lot, most of them, they're so saturated and we are also saturated that there's so much we can do. So we try to give them all different ones, but there isn't, even if we had a resource to write something, it doesn't help because they don't use that. Mm -hmm. You know, people keep saying, oh, you need social media. Social media doesn't help if they don't use it. Mm -hmm. exactly. It's word of mouth. Exactly. Thank you very much, Anna. Yes, I agree. This population is extremely, extremely resilient. And I'm going to hopefully get to talk about that uh, in a little bit. But yes, absolutely. Thank you very much for, for what you said. Could I offer two two possibilities in yes. terms of strength? Um, I, I don't know how many people would agree with me, but I think imagination is an incredible strength. Um, and to be able to imagine a future Mm -hmm. um, is so important. And another strength, which, you know, she just happens to have is her relative youth, her relative young age. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. Thank you very much. Imagination is really important. Thank you. Somebody else? Um, I mean, her, if she came alone with her, um, two kids I mean she can apply for asylum because you know she could have a strong case but her kids are young they came before the age of 18 so they could apply for a special immigrant juvenile visa and that would be probably an easier so pathway for them to get legalized at least as long as they can get connected to the right resources you know they have a chance to be to legalize their status that could release relieve a lot of the all these stress factors that they have Mm -hmm. And that, that's, that's another thing that uh, one uh, immigration, like the request for one immigration relief doesn't eliminate the other. So someone can, be, can apply for asylum while at the same time apply for seats. Mm -hmm. so that's very important. Now, another thing that I thought of was uh, in terms of strength was um, the case said that she left friends and family be behind. That means that she had friends that she was able to make friends. She has the social ability to make friends. That in itself is already a strength. Um, and she had relationship with, with relatives, with family members. That is also a strength. Um, she cared for her children enough to leave, just like Anna uh, mentioned, and that's really important. And another thing and that it's pretty related is also, uh, it sounded like she had pretty sound judgment. Like there was a real, threat to her children and she acknowledged it as such and acted on it. Okay, the last question is, what may you do to help advocate for, for her or for them? And there were already some answers to that. Does somebody want to add something else? Um, it's okay, we answered it before. So now I'm gonna back, I'm gonna go back to the sharing and 
a little bit behind, so I'm gonna <laughs> go a little bit uh, faster. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about trauma. What is trauma? What does it look like? Um, Um, and so that, that case was a good segue into this new section, the, the, the trauma section. Science has learned a lot about the effects of trauma, not just in children, but of its manifestations in that child when they grow up. So what I'm going to talk about, I encourage you to think of it, not only in terms of children, but in terms of the adults who were once children and who like you may be seeing uh, the results of childhood trauma uh, in them as adults now. So first, what is trauma? Trauma is directly experiencing or witnessing a traumatic event, but we now know that learning about a traumatic event can also be considered trauma. So it's a direct or indirect exposure to intense and overwhelming experiences that involve threat or harm to a person's physical and or emotional integrity. It usually overwhelms a person's coping resources, and it can lead to coping mechanisms that can help the person survive in that moment in the short run, but may create us uh, or cause a serious harm in the long run. And probably many of you have heard this, the, the fight, freeze, or flight response uh, when it comes to trauma. And what's very important here is to understand that trauma the, is a... Two people can be... Can you hear me? We can. The audio source okay. changed, but we can hear you. Is it better or worse? It's okay. It's good. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's a subjective experience that's going to determine whether something is traumatic or not. Two people can be in the same room and something happens in that room. And one person may, may, um, may be impacted in a very different way than the other person with the same event. So it's really a subjective experience. These are some types of trauma, um, single event or chronic. But what I, the reason why I put this, uh, why I put all, the, all of this here is just to give you an idea that it's not just like one kind of thing. There can be many different things. For example, the systemic, um, the systemic trauma is when it's inflicted by a state sponsor or medical institution, such as La Yelera, or such as this processing centers. Um, and it's important also to understand that one doesn't, um, uh, that they're cum cumulative. Like w if it's like a well oiled machine is kind of a perfect storm. But one, um, if you have one, it doesn't mean that you don't have the others. So there are different types and they work together and at the same time. Now, these are some challenges in identifying trauma or abuse. Number one, it can be language barriers. Even if you speak the same language as the person, uh, there are some things that you may not be able to understand. For example, Spanish. There may be some expressions in, uh, in Spanish from another country or, or just some cultural things that you, that you won't get. Also, the conceptualization of problems. I encourage people always to, to not use the words maltrato or abuse or abuso when, when asking about facts and when trying to interview people to, to get facts um, because people are gonna have very different concepts of what abuso or maltrato, mistreatment or, or abuse is. So you can focus on specific behaviors. Like you can ask, okay, so when, when you got in trouble um, at home, like how, would you, how were you punished? This is like a general open-ended question. Another thing is our own comfort level discussing trauma a feeling of pity or vicarious trauma and multicultural sensitivity, understanding their values and the diversity among them, as I mentioned at the beginning, our level of awareness of our own stereotypes and judgments and the risk of over or under pathologizing trauma. You can have someone, you know, I, I constantly get uh, from patients that they say, well, yeah, I mean, yes, my mom, when I got punished, she would throw rocks at me, rocks to my head, for example. But, but my sister had it much worse because this and this and that. And so it's important to, to uh, just keep things in, keep this in mind 
that whatever you think and the way that you see things may be very different to the way that the person who you're interviewing or working with uh, does. Now, I'm going to talk about the, how the child's brain is built. Neurons are the building blocks of the brain. During development, neurons connect and create networks that link to create systems. These connections are called synapses, and they organize the brain by forming pathways that regulate all brain functions uh, that govern everything we do, from, from breathing and sleeping to thinking and feeling. Uh, hold on. Oh, yeah. Um, so the development of synapses occurs at an astounding rate during child early years in response to, the, to that child's experiences. By the time they're two years old, their brains will have approximately 100 trillion synapses. Based on the child's experiences, some synapses will be strengthened and remain intact, but many will gradually be discarded. This process is sometimes called the use it or lose it system. And so I like this picture because I think that is explained very well, like somebody or something used that same path over and over. And so now it's a marked path. Now it's easy to see, it's easy to go through it. It's familiar to whoever uses it. Um, and going to the sides would be more difficult. It's not that it's impossible, but it's, the person is not used to it. Um, and so it is through these processes of creating and strengthening uh, and discarding that our brains adapt to our unique environment. With strong, uh, frequent, or prolonged traumatic experiences, well, first, uh, I want to give you an example. If a child has to be on the constant lookout to protect themselves from, let's say, an, an alcoholic, um, violent parent, they are going to, oh, hold on, sorry. First, I, I want to say this that I wanna talk about the impact of trauma in the creation of these pathways. With strong, frequent, or prolonged traumatic experiences, the pathways getting the most use are those in response to the trauma. This reduces the formation of other pathways needed for adaptive behavior, which can lead to impairment later in life. And then I was sharing this, sorry for my confusion, this example. If a child has to be uh, on the constant lookout for a parent that is, abusive and violent, and in this particular example, if they abuse substances, so they're, if they're an uh, are, are alcoholic, uh, the pathways getting the most use for this child are gonna be those that the child needs for surviving that parent. So learning where I'm gonna go hide, learning what I can do to survive my violent parent. Whereas for example, the pathways used to learn how to make friends will be reduced, which can then lead to the child not learning how to socialize or make friends later in life. So the, the pathways that you use the most are the ones that you're gonna be good at. In other words, strong, frequent, or prolonged activation of the body's stress response system, which is also called toxic stress, in the absence of a buffering protective adult can cause a disruption of brain circuitry and other organ and metabolic systems during sensitive developmental periods. This disruption may result in later impairments in learning and behavior, as well as uh, be the, the roots of chronic stress-related physical and mental illness. So these are some of the physical and mental illnesses that may come as adults as a consequence of childhood trauma. And both children and adults may be able to make up for some of the missed experiences later in life, but it will likely be more difficult, especially if the child was deprived of certain stimulation when uh, that resulted in the discarding of the relevant pathway. Um, okay, so I'm gonna talk about the effects of trauma on behavioral, social, and emotional functioning. The first one is a persistent fear response. If children live in a, in a chaotic or threatening world, one in which their caregivers respond with abuse or chronically provide no response, their brains are gonna become hyper alert for danger and not fully developed. Uh, so chronic activation of the neuronal pathways involved in the fear response can create permanent memories that shape the child's perception of and, uh, of and response to the environment. It can become a way of life that is difficult to change, even if the environment improves. Children may lose their ability to differentiate between danger and safety 
and may constantly identify a threat in a non-threatening situation. And I think this image does a better work, work, uh, job at explaining all of this. Like there's no danger, but the child sees a danger because that's the way that they have, that they're used to now. Another thing, uh, another effect of the of chronic stress or trauma behavior, social and emotional functioning is increased internalizing symptoms. These are related to emotion and stress regulation, which can develop into depression. So we have the social withdrawal, feeling lonely, sad, unloved, nervous. So it's the child who, when they something is happening, they they uh, they go into themselves. Uh, and early emotional abuse or severe severe deprivation. Uh, may permanently alter the brain's ability to produce feelings of well-being and emotional stability. So even if this happened years ago, if there was no, um, if there was no adult or nothing, nothing was done uh, about this, the the child may may be left without the possibility of feeling well-being. Um, okay. So increased internalizing symptoms. Uh, also diminished executive function. They have, this has to do with working memory, filtering thoughts and impulses, adjusting to change demands, priorities or perspective, and it can be low in lower academic achievement, intellectual impairment, decreased IQ, and weakened ability to maintain attention. So for example, a child leaves that, a child leaving the, their homework at home or forgets about an exam or an appointment with a case manager or a doctor or a therapist or an attorney or constantly lose they constantly lose things, or they have a strong difficulty, for example, calling to make an appointment. So all of these are executive executive functioning um, abilities that are diminished because of, of trauma. And lastly, we have hyperarousal. Children may be highly sensitive to nonverbal cues, such as eye contact or touch on the arm, and they may be more likely to misinterpret them. Children are, may, who have endured a lot of trauma can be consumed with monitoring nonverbal cues for threats. And because of that, they're less able to interpret and respond to verbal cues, even when they are in an environment typically considered non-threatening, such as, as a classroom. So in the example of the, the person who was constantly on the lookout for the abusive uh, parent, it's not that the abusive parent came home and said, I'm going to do something. It's that the the child learn that when they hear the knock, the, the doorknob um, switch, or they hear the parent coming in, uh, in, you know, with specific movements or specific sounds, like all of this is non-verbal. So they, or, or a lot of times it happens with, um, with um, uh, eye contact. Uh, they're looking for that, like what's going to trigger this person that is going to cause trauma in me. So in the, if they're in a classroom, they may be constantly monitoring the teacher for their nonverbal cues. Like, is this teacher mad at me? Are they doing their fists like this? Like, am I in danger with a teacher? Is the teacher uh, passing next to me and they touch my shoulder? Like, is that something that I have to be worried of? When most times child, uh, classrooms are not at least not in this, under these circumstances, are not uh, dangerous places for children. Uh, they're often labeled learning dis uh, labeled as, as learning disabled, but their brains have developed in a way that they are always alert and unable to achieve their relative calm that is necessary for learning. So it's not that they are learning disabled, it's that their brain needs to focus on surviving and on other things, and they have less space for math or geometry or geography. Okay, now these are some of the most common mental health conditions that I see or that can be seen in this population. PTSD, complex trauma, issues with attachment, uh, and the rest, acculturative stress, depression, anxiety. So I'm gonna go very quickly through just a couple of them. Post-traumatic stress disorder um, shows an, you know, this, all of these areas are, not all, some of these areas are affected intrusion like nightmares or intrusive thoughts, avoidance like people can with trauma and with uh, PTSD symptoms uh, may avoid places or people or things that remind them of the event. Negative alterations in mood or con in cognitions and mood, um, they may have inability to recall details. Um, they have negative beliefs about themselves. 
distorted blame of self and others, um, persistent trauma-related emotions, diminished interest in activities, detachment, withdrawal, alienation, and, and lack of joy that I mentioned. And so in negative, in, um, in, no, never mind. Alterations in arousal and reactivity, they're often irritable and aggressive, uh, or they can be self-destructive, hypervigilant. They may have an exaggerated startle response, problems with concentration and sleeping disturbance. And so, so this is this is PTSD, but we know that just because someone experienced trauma doesn't mean that they have PTSD, that they meet the diagnosis for that. So uh, what I do with my patients is that I, whether they meet criteria or not, I um, do a lot of psychoeducation, normalizing the symptoms, explaining that, you know, normalizing their symptoms in these four domains. Um, now, complex trauma is exposure to multiple prolonged ongoing and or chronic traumatic events. Uh, and they most often be, uh, begin in childhood. Um, and most likely they occur within the primary caregiving system, so it's interpersonal trauma. And they happened uh, in an unmitigated, like when they're unmitigated by the relationship with a trusting and loving adult. Um, and some of the things that reflect complex trauma is uh, attachment. These are some of the areas that are affected by complex trauma, attachment and relationships, um, negotiating and developing, the difficulty trusting, connecting and negotiating relationships, establishing trust, uh, affect regulation and behavior, difficulty regulating emotions, for impulse control, they interrupt and yell easily, hit, escape, um, under or over respond to sensory stimuli, a uh, sense of, of purpose. Um, they may have very little the, the ability to see themselves as capable of achieving goals or having a future. Um, dissociation may result, is the result of uh, overwhelming coping resources and they, present, they can present with flat affect uh, or often affect that is incongruent with what they're saying. So somebody can be telling you about how they were assaulted and they may be laughing or giggling or have a completely a complete lack of affect. And this is a result of trauma. Uh, also physical health, as I mentioned, self-perception, <clears throat> a uh, sense of shame or self or low self-worth, decreased values. In negative expectations, decrease, decrease competency, they have a pattern of negative uh, thoughts, negative self-talk, and cognition, thinking, learning, concentrating is what I was mentioning before. And so some of this I already mentioned, but it's important just to keep in mind that in addition to all that, when you're interviewing someone from this population, these are some of the things that you may also see, especially I want you to pay attention to the difficulty with attention, concentration, and recall, they may have little or no elaboration or, of their narrative and their story may not be organized. So they may start by the end and then come back to the middle and then, and the, and then uh, not share things that you think are extremely important, but for them it may not be, or they may not remember details of things that are really, really important. And this is all um, the impact of trauma. Uh, these are just some examples of internalizing reactions and, and externalizing reactions and one person can can go to both of them at different times or at different days so it's not that you're you're just an internalizer or you're just an externalizer these are just some reactions so when you see these reactions in people that you're working with in this population or in any population actually uh, i encourage you to think about them that there may be a reaction to trauma um, now, does all trauma or abuse have the same effect? No, these are some of the factors that are gonna influence how much effect is caused by trauma. The age, whether it was a one-time thing or it's something chronic, the, the identity of the abuser, whether there were other things happening at the same time, the type and severity of, of the abuse or the maltreatment, other individual or environmental characteristics, and as I mentioned before, the presence of a dependable nur nurturing adult in the child's life, particularly one that would buffer the impact of the traumatic event, just like we saw Gloria uh, from the case. 
And so this is just to briefly touch upon um, attachment, which is the bond between a parent and a caregiver and or caregiver and the child that is essential for healthy and normative child development. Um, attachment is extremely important for the development of capacities and functioning well into adulthood. Um, and it also plays an essential role in developing the capacities such as social skills and emotional regulation and self-concept. When there's a disruption in this relationship, it can impact the, child, the child's development well into adulthood including poor physical health and, and socio-emotional outcomes. Um, so research on the impact of trauma in children finds that the strongest predictor in a child's recovery is that patient's support during the traumatic event and the, their involvement following events of healing. We're gonna take a three minute break. Please be back by 11.30, so we still have a couple of, a few slides to go through. Uh, what did I say? 11, like 33. We'll start again. Stretch, go, drink water.
Okay, everybody, welcome back from the longest break in the world. Um, Okay. Can you hear me well? Perfect. Okay. So now yes. we, thank you. Now we're going to talk about, um, we're going to shift a little bit, shift gears a little bit, and we're going to talk about uh, trauma informed, how, like how to, guidelines on what to, how to provide trauma informed care. Um, and to do that, it's just it's important to understand that a trauma informed um, reframe that trauma is, it's important to to like absorb a trauma informed reframe reframe, which is that trauma related symptoms and behaviors originate from adapting to traumatic experiences. A trauma informed perspective views trauma related symptoms and behaviors as an individual's best and most resilient attempt to manage, cope with, and rise above their experience of trauma. So it's important to ask and to, to when you're working with this population, uh, to ask not just like, why are you like this, but what happened to you? Like to understand that the way that people are presenting is the result of them using their coping mechanisms, their, their, um, their coping strategies uh, to adapt to surviving the different things that they experience. And as Anna was mentioning before, um, this community or this population is extremely resilient, probably the most resilient population that I have met in my life. Um, resilience uh, is the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, or even significant sources of stress. It's learning to cope with manageable threats to our physical and social well-being, and it's critical for the development of resilience. Um, and so, a resilience approach. Well, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but resilience is determined by interacting biological, uh, psychological, social, and cultural factors, and it can be built. It's not something that you're either born with or without. It's something that can be developed. Uh, it's not an innate trait or a resource that can be just used up. There's this. Um, theory that's called the migration of the fittest, coined by Escobar, um, which states that the migrants who are in the United States, um, who made it along their journey, uh, you know, who, who survived their journey and made it to the United States, are already much more resilient than their peers who either didn't attempt to make the journey in similar conditions or those who did, but did not uh, make it out alive. So yes, this is a really resilient population. And it's important to keep in mind that many unaccompanied children and uh, adults show a remarkable ability to function well following a resettlement in the United States. And also, and most importantly, that they tend to identify with narratives of strength through adversity rather than victimization. Um, they have this mentality of, you know, seguir siempre para adelante, of, of moving ahead and looking forward and like advancing themselves and, and, and their children, like looking after their children and, and just improving their lives. Uh, and not, not like, which is pretty far away from them seeing themselves as victims. And that is my personal experience too when working with this population. Now, what can you do when providing, to providing trauma-informed care? And, and of course, this is gonna be a little general because there are people from many different professions here. And so this is gonna you know, vary, but I would say first and foremost, empathy. That's just being nice and being empathic. You are already gonna be taking a huge step uh, there are many people in these people's lives that are not nice, that are not respectful, that are not empathic, that are not 
um, human or humane with them. So just being empathic and nice, you are already a step ahead of a lot of people who they have to deal with. Um, try to build rapport and a general sense of safety and protection before interviewing for facts. They help establish a, a relationship of trust. And um, very often, distraction is a good way to do this, like drawing or coloring always takes the, the pressure off, but also like start with non-threatening or like, anxiety provoking, provoking topics. So for example, if it's with children, you can start asking them like about their favorite um, singer or video game or soccer um, team, stuff like that, stuff that don't include their, you know, their emotions, those facts that they can easily share. Um, and you want to also thank the child for meeting you and with talking to you and you know, depending on which profession you are, but you may be asking very um, intrusive questions. Well, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. But the thing is that the more you build relationship with them, the more they trust you, the more you'll be able to work with them to for them to provide the information that you may need to do your own work. You want a clarification. You want clarification of the encounter. Explain to them what you can do for them or, or why they're there. If it's someone in mental health, or if it's someone in mental health, you can explain what, you know, why, what you can do or what your role is. If it's someone in legal, you can explain, like, just explain your role and what you can, why they're there. Um, promote agency and control and provide choice. You want to minimize re-traumatization. You want to allow them to tell their story in their own words. They are the experts in their own lives, so you don't want to interrupt, for example. You want to allow them to let you, to indicate when, if and when they want to stop the, the encounter, they want to stop talking about something in particular or whether they just want to leave a, at a certain point. You want to promote them feeling safe. Um, if they're distressed, you want to allow for time at the end or at, in that moment to return to baseline with neutral topics before, um, uh, before letting them go. Uh, but you have to be very mindful of that. Like, you have to read nonverbal cues. Like if someone starts to cry or starts to, you know, just let them cry. Like if, and, and this is another, this is coming um, up too, but um, just allow them that, that space and allow them to know that they can, that they are never going to be forced to do anything they don't want. And that, that includes telling you things that they don't want to talk about. And if, if you have to work with trauma for different reasons, if you're in mental health or in law or in case manage management or in you know specific things, uh, you're gonna get more if you build a relationship first and allow for, for and, and allow them to have this sense of agency and control than if you don't. Uh, alleviation of fears, um, you want to be honest. It's on one hand, it's okay to say, I don't know. And another thing is important to clarify that where the information they're gonna they're providing you with is going. You want to make sure that they understand that this is that their families back home are not gonna be in danger because they're sharing what they're sharing with you, for example. Or the a, a alleviation of fears too. For example, if it's mental health and you're working with someone who has a, a, an asylum hearing or an immigration hearing, you want to explain to them that, no, it's not that if they say something wrong, people are gonna laugh during the hearing, or it's not that if they don't say the right thing, they're gonna be deported right away. Like you wanna discuss and alleviate their fears. You want to try to instill hope to, to the, the most that you can, uh, without lying, of course. You want to be aware of the trauma consistent of the relations in migrants, but I discussed before, uh, the stigmatized, you want to reflect their symptoms seen as adaptive ways to attempt to cope. So you can say, well, yes, I understand that this makes you very sad and this is normal and this is valid um, or, or you know, other symptoms that they may bring up to you. You want to highlight their strengths like, um, Oh, you! I see that you're you're learning English pretty well, or that you're doing well, well in school, or other things in which they have adapted. Um, identify and underscore their protective factors, and this can be an ability to set an accomplished goal, or their intelligence, or a special talent, 
or their sociability or appealing or good na natured disposition um, or their ability to distance themselves from negative experiences, they, them having impulse control. You also want to remain present and patient and allow, allow for emotional expression. If they need to cry, allow them to cry. If they need to be silent for a little bit, allow them to be silent. If they want to, um, I, in my practice, I, I always, like I never frown upon like bad words or any way they want to express. Like I have no limits to that. I mean, if they, you know, nobody actually has ever um, been aggressive towards me in particular, but if they are expressing their experiences or their thoughts or feelings with aggression, as long as it's not towards me, I'll allow it. I'll allow anything. And finally, normalize and refer to mental health services if needed. Most may not know exactly what mental health is, and there's a lot of stigma that mental health or therapy is for crazy people. So there's a lot of destigmatization that needs to be done. Uh, and it's important for them, not only for them to be able to process their experiences, but also because it can be very helpful as uh, support, uh, evidentiary support for their immigration case. As, as um, Ansley mentioned at the beginning, some of the things that I do and that other therapists do is um, write evaluations or affidavits in support of immigration cases. Um, so, well, and actually this leads me to this other site, which is uh, that access to healthcare can be crucial in supporting a child or an adult's immigration case. We clinicians can un uncover and document key medical and mental health evidence. For example, a doctor can um, uncover a bullet lodged in the spine or an intellectual disability, which may make the child target of further persecution, therefore placing them in a um, particular social group, which is one of the criteria for asylum. Or a therapist can also uh, uncover an intellectual disability, but also uh, other traumas that could make the case or make it stronger. For example, I had a patient who had shared with her attorney that she uh, was sexually harassed by a gang member. What she didn't tell her attorney is that in fact, this gang member um, abused her. And so um, this is, can be crucial for the, for the case. So either I'll work with the patient so that they are able to share it with their attorney uh, or I'll communicate with the attorney. I'll help with the communication always, always with the um, uh, express authorization and consent of my patient. But sometimes they don't know things that can be help for, helpful for a case. So when we as clinicians or people, whether clinicians or not, but we learn about these things, sometimes like a, an alarm goes out of in our mind saying, oh, this can be very important for the case. And so that's why it's, it can be very helpful for them to be connected to mental health services, but also to, to medical care. Um, so, and as I mentioned, we can enhance a patient's ability to communicate with their lawyer, but also, to testify in court, we, I, as a mental health provider, help them mentally and emotionally prepare for their hearing. So I'll process their thoughts and feelings before the hearing, and I will um, um, dis dissolve or, or like address their fears, as I was mentioning before, um, and also do that after the hearing. I'll, I'll help them explore their experience and process their experience, what it was like for them. Um, and finally, we also sometimes are asked to testify in court, and this also reduces the risk of re-traumatization. Well, all of it reduces the, re the risk of re-traumatization of the patient. So as therapists, one of the, some of the things that I specifically do to support the immigration case is, one, write um, affidavits or mental health evaluations for my patients, uh, help communication with the attorney, and uh, testify in court. And when, when we do this, this evaluation, for example, is I'm going to help the judge or the asylum officer or whoever's going to decide the immigration case, help, help them understand who the person in front of them is, like what experiences this person went through in their country of origin that made them migrate, uh, how that, um, what that looks like 
uh, what that trauma was for them then and what it looks like now. Like, what are the mental health um, diagnosis or symptoms that they have? So, what you know, what what trauma looks like in them in that particular person. So I'll say, so this person uses laughter as a coping mechanism. So if the person is using that when the judge is asking them for something serious and they start giggling or laughing, I want the judge to understand that it's not because they're mocking the judge or because they're lying or because they didn't experience it. It's because it's a trauma reaction. And so these are some of the things of the ways that um, therapists or medical providers can help um, or, or social workers in general can help um, support immigration cases. Now, I have, so this is, this is the end of the presentation slides. I have another case prepared, but I also see that we have uh, like 10 minutes. So I don't know if to leave it open for questions and comments or um, to put the case in, and maybe not in breakout rooms, but here out in the open. And so what, what do you think? I mean, it or seems like people. folks had had questions before. So maybe we can open up the the floor for, for questions and, um, you know, just to see if there's any outstanding uh, issues that um, anybody has or come to mind. Um, I know there were some questions kind of around service access, helping to find um, services, maybe a question around um, finding mental health care providers. I know that that's a, sometimes an issue um, with organizations. There's a, a high need for mental health providers, but sometimes they're difficult to find. So um, I don't know if anybody has any thoughts, suggestions, or questions around that. Natalie? Um, actually, ACS. I mean, I understand ACS is New York City, uh, but any administration for children's services. Um, and what people's experience is in terms of working with immigrants who, huh, who encounter great difficulties with ACS, uh, whose children, after their traumatic arrival in the United States, whose children are actually removed from their homes and placed in foster care. And, you know, how, how do we go about helping people to navigate that system? It's a tremendous challenge. And I'm just curious if other people have encountered this. I had a, a young woman, can you hear me? I had a young woman who um, was, her child was taken away. Cultural difficulties, she was very upset. She didn't know where to take him. She didn't speak the language. So she went to the hospital. He had bruises or she had bruises. She was very young, she kept falling. So she thought something was wrong with her neurologically. She took her to the hospital um, and she didn't know where to go. She went to emergency and emergency when they saw this little girl with bruises, the first thing they did was to take her to domestic abuse center. They immediately took the mother and they sent it to CPS, uh, Child Protective Services. They took the child away from this young, traumatized woman who was having lots of problems. And they could, we could not get her. You know, she did get a court appointed lawyer, but it was a court appointed lawyer because at that point it was not immigration anymore, it was criminal. And so she had a lawyer, but he was overwhelmed too. Um, and at least the only thing I did was that I kept speaking with her, talking with her throughout this whole process. And I think even though I could not do much but listen, that listening helped because she didn't have anyone else. And 
I think as providers, that's, you know, at some point we have to see, we can try to fight the system, we can try to find other organizations, but when other organizations can't come through, you just have to keep in mind that client, that person, and think of her needs and then just go with that. And I kept with her. She finally was given the child back, but it took almost a year. And now she's starting to call me less and less, which I think is a very positive thing. I mean, I miss her, but I'm so happy for her because she is, you know, getting on her way. So that's about. That's a great example. Um, I also, I guess, had a question about the new asylum ban. I was curious if, do you feel that this was implemented specifically because title 42 you know was rescinded they you know like in lieu of not having title 42 as an excuse to turn people away this was implemented in place like you know the timing seems awfully suspicious and absolutely uh, yeah no no it was like this was the plan okay for when title 42 was done and there's really it's like only through the app is the only way to get on the list yes Wow. wow. Yeah, but because it's so new, I don't, you know, one thing is the theory and the other the practice. I don't know because it's so new. I don't know. I mean, I just know in terms of practice that people are, are having a lot of trouble with the app, but I don't know what's, what's happening in terms of expedited removals and like how that is translating into reality. I know that in theory, that's, that's how it's supposed to be now. Um, but I don't know what's happening in, in reality or whether they are applying that to absolutely everyone. In theory, they are. In practice, I'm not sure. I think the app is good if it finally comes through, but as you said, it is filled with glitches and so many cannot get on. But if they do get on, they do eventually get a court date. Their court date is 2028, 2029. They do not understand that. It's the first court date. They have like three or four court dates after that. So if it's in 2028, they can apply for their asylum. And once they apply for asylum within 150 days, they can apply for their work authorization. That's one of the things we're trying to do is to change that so that they can apply for work authorization right once they get here. That has not been the case. It was changed to a year before. It was changed back to 150 days now. And, you know, that's still in flux but it's still very hard for them to understand that. They think, oh, I got this app, I got it, I'm good. No, it's only the first step. And one of the things they think, oh, it's 2028, that's you know going to take forever. That's what we think, but actually for them as asylum seekers, as trying to get into a country and trying to maneuver everything, it's much better for them to have more time in order to get their social community in order to get everything else in order, their housing, their language, their school, everything, and get that trauma is, you know, out of the way, get, get to be in a place where they feel safe, finally, before they have to deal with this whole legal battle. That, so, that is, thank you. Yes, I think that is true. The way that I understand, and again, like this is, this is really new, but the way that I understand it, and also because I have patients who have, I have a patient who has a sister at the border right now, and they, and like she has been trying to use the app for the last month, awesome. um, is that uh, the appointment that they're supposed to get through the app is not for immigration courts, but just to get through the door, like just to to have oh. a, um, a credible fear interview, which is now, now it moved from credible fear to it's most likely that you will be harmed. 
So the, the threshold is uh, increased. It used to be like you have credible fear to go back to your country. Now it's not just it's credible fear. It's it went from credible to it's likely that something is going to happen to you. And it's just like words, but it's a big it's a big oh, change. Big. So and so, yes, once they get in and once at least until now, when they get the credible fear interview and they're allowed into the country, they are allowed so that they can go through their immigration process while inside the country. And yes, that sometimes takes takes many years. Um, and sometimes that, you know, it, it depends on how long that takes. It can serve some, some purposes, but also there are so many delays uh, with, with work authorization that that is not good for them. But also um, because of these delays in getting the app, like the app is supposed to get them the first interview for them to get their foot on, on the door. And because this is not happening, people are having to spend much more, many more days and months and sometimes years in the migrant camp. Right, right. Which are horrible. They're yes. extremely, extremely dangerous. And they can only use the app if they are at the border, like physically at the border or in Mexico City. Uh, okay. So See, it's not like they, they can try using the app when they're in Guatemala. Right. Or even in the south of Mexico. They have to be at the border. Okay. Because I've met a few people who have gotten into the country with CBP-1. And so I have met them and they say, it's great. I got in. But they did have help from uh, an organization there, which is wonderful. If you know it, it's Al Otro Lado. And they are great. And they will take families, people with children, anybody, if they can help them, you know, spread the word. Al otro lado. It's it's a great organization. Um, but yes, if they don't get into that app, and I didn't know, I haven't kept up because the last people I saw from there came a few months ago with the CBP one. Um, so I don't know what's going on now. I know it's always changing, just like this work authorization. It's it's all over the place. Yes, it is. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I just put my, I know what we have to go because we don't have any more time, but if people have questions, comments, complaints, everything, anything you want to contact me, I just put my name and my email on the chat. Feel free to shoot me an email. And I'm also going to drop the continuing education registration link in the chat again, in case you missed it the first time. Um, again, this is uh, available for continuing education credits. So if you are a social worker or a mental health worker, please register so we can issue you those credits. But thank you everyone for joining. This has been a really fantastic uh, morning with you all. Thank you, Brenda, for guiding us through this discussion on trauma-informed care. And uh, it's you know great to be in a space with you all. And I really hope that uh, we'll see you in future training sessions. So uh, enjoy the rest of your day and have also a great weekend. We're almost there. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all. And thank you for participating. Yes. Thank you. Thank have you. Have a wonderful so much, weekend, everyone. everyone. Thank you. Bye, and thank you. Bye-bye.